Have you ever wondered how you can reach the gospel to other people without kind of feeling like a jerk? That's what we'll talk about today. The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It's a command to be obeyed. Hudson Taylor. Today we're going to continue the conversation that discusses how evangelism can be less stressful. This is a presentation that I give at a Christian college because, believe it or not, even people who work in a Christian college are trained in a Christian college to be teachers and pastors and other types of occupations within the church. It still is intimidating to reach other people with the message of God. And the way I look at it is a couple of different ways, is that first of all, when I go to work on a Monday and I say, oh, I saw this amazing movie. It was so good. You just have to see it. It's genuine because it's a part of my life. People know I like to go to nerd movies. Or if someone goes to a fantastic restaurant, you expect they're going to tell you about it. And I fundamentally believe that some of our problem with evangelism or reaching others with the gospel has a little bit to do with the fact that our lives are not as integrated with God as we would hope it would be. Otherwise, I think it would be a lot easier. And again, I'm a result because someone reached out to me. Someone brought the word of God, even though I knew it. I grew up knowing it. I knew lots of Christians. But someone talked to me about God, and I stopped saying no. I stopped fighting the love, the compassion, the forgiveness of God. And so I'm grateful that someone talked to me about it and just didn't say, "Hmm, you know, I kind of have a headache today and I don't feel like it. So the first thing to know is that the victory is God's. God loves an outweighed victory. In Judges, he told Gideon, like, go pick the worst people and go make them your soldiers. Send most of them home. You don't need that big, gigantic army. Because he wanted it to be this clear image of God's doing. And Jesus' association with Nazareth. In John, it says nothing good is in Nazareth. You know, we think about places like I grew up. When you think about those places and if you say, oh, this professor is fantastic. He comes from Gwynn, Michigan. You'd be like, well. Nothing really good comes from Gwen, Michigan. You know, it's that kind of idea. But God's victory is his own. Romans 9 says that we can be lumps of clay that are used for God's purpose. So he loves forming us into something that makes us great. And if we think, you know, I've sinned too much. I've done too many wrong things. I have no place in the world of God. I have no place in his mission. Well, take a look at the Bible, because the whole Bible is just filled with people who messed up over and over again, really badly. I mean, no one messed up more than Samson. No one messed up more than David. A lot of people were complete screw-ups, but you know what? God wants them to be a part of his mission. This is a tough time. People get canceled. People get shamed or embarrassed because they talk about God, and they talk about their faith. And every time I have done this presentation, I think I've done it for almost a decade, if not more, I read the passage from 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5, where it says, For a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They'll turn their ear away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And when I first read that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I thought, wow, it sounds like today. It has sounded more and more like today every year I've given this presentation. Everyone wants to hear what they want to hear. Someone said, don't you feel that the world is becoming more atheistic? I don't think it is. I think it's getting weirder. I see people who are declared atheists talk about crystals, talk about astrology talk about tarot cards and reading tea leaves and worshiping this or worshiping that. I saw a number of crimes committed with people who have decided they're Vikings. How do we get back to the Vikings? But now here we are 
back to Vikings. So it's not that people are losing faith. They are putting their faith into everything. And then comes the question of urgency. I don't feel like I should do it. I feel sometimes myself too. Well, I'm not going to say anything today. Super tired, not feeling all that social. And there's no sense of urgency in us telling other people about the good news. And Romans 10 says that how can anyone believe if they haven't heard? How can they hear if unless someone is preaching to them? And I don't mean preaching to them as in the angry, I'm telling you what to do. I'm telling them about the gospel and the good news of Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we have a clear message and we have a clear urgency. I mentioned the last time that if you saw a bridge was out, And you said, "Eh, I see all these bikers who are about to fly off the edge of the bridge, but I'm feeling very antisocial today. I'll tell someone about it tomorrow. Or maybe I'll just call the city and they'll deal with it. You know, there's, there's no sense of urgency in us. And, you know, the time that I told my dad I became a Christian, we went out for lunch. And I told him, and I told you this in my own story, I never saw him again. And he died. I don't know who talked to him since I left, but I had one shot and I didn't take it. You know, I had a shot with my grandmother and I didn't take it either. It's hard because you don't know when you're going to see people and you don't know when they're going to go up against where that bridge is out. It's easy for us to see the bikers heading towards the bridge. It's not so easy to see when we're looking at people around us. So we have to have some urgency. And then all these people talk about in the Bible, and we wish we could be more like them, where Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Who says that? Isaiah does. Or in Luke, where Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. (laughs) Those are amazing people, because most of us would probably crawl into bed if we heard any of those messages. And the other part, and this is my favorite uh, piece about it, is where Luke talks about that nobody hides a light in a jar and puts it under your bed. I mentioned before that back in the time of Jesus, you could work months, hours of light, maybe even just an hour of light. So this image that you would light something so expensive, and then maybe it'd be like buying the Hope Diamond, the biggest diamond in the world, and then putting it in a case and burying it in your backyard because you never wanted to look at it. It's just completely outside the image of what we should be doing. If we light a light, we want it to shine. And that's the same thing with the message of God. That's what Luke is saying. We would never take the message of God, which is good news for everybody, and hide it. I give this cartoon in my presentation where there's a kid going, there's only four more days until The Hobbit. And then someone says, do you have to scream that outside my window? And he goes, well, it's not necessary, but a service to the public I consider to be my civic duty. We feel excited to tell people about great shows, great movies, fantastic restaurants. But then that fundamental problem happens that we feel a little less excited to tell them about the best news of our life at all. So it's so easy for us to highlight, to to be exuberant about the things that actually really excite us. And it's so hard to talk to other people about Jesus that I get it too. Same thing. But God tells us not to be fearful. We did that podcast, I'm being afraid, because God is with us wherever we go. And so we have to stand firm. The other thing you have to be careful about is to, if you are going to share the gospel, is to be humble. The mere act of telling someone about Jesus, I think, or any philosophy in life or anything like that, has a bit of, it's not arrogance, but people hear it as arrogance. I'm telling you what to do because you're not doing the right thing. And people hear that. Someone said to me once that she thought that the Christmas letters that people send out with pictures of their family and what they did over the last year was arrogant because they were just saying, look at my cool family. 
I bet your family's not as awesome. And I said, oh, I know people who do that. They do not think that. They're just like, hey, here's my family. You know, it's meant to be friendly. But some people just will read into that, that kind of arrogance into it. So you have to be particularly careful when you're going to share the gospel. And remember to be patient. There's so many people who talk to me about Jesus throughout my life, and it looks like it had no fruit. But I think it's not just my friend at the very end who helped. I think it was all the people along the way, too. So even if you never see that kapow moment, my friend got to see it. All those other people never saw it. You have to realize that God talks often about seeds, about fruit, and all of that takes time. So please don't think that maybe if you didn't see a big bang moment happen, that's why. And it's important then to read more, read more of the scriptures. It'll help you. It'll help keep you calm. Give thanks. Pray. Meditate on the word. It's a little bit different than the Eastern meditation. It's more like what they call ruminating. When a cow chews its cud, it's just going over and over and over on the same thing till it's thoroughly chopped up. That's what meditation is. It's filling yourself with God. But if you do those things, it'll help you gain some strength. So some common pitfalls people have when they are telling people about God and sharing their faith is they may not tell the truth. All those people told me not even what they believed but they were too uh, scared to say it. Sometimes people just don't say anything. They procrastinate. Like I said, we have to have that urgency there. Sometimes people feel used or you tackle someone on the street. If you were going to die today, where would you go? And I know that's a big popular technique, but it really intimidates people, you know, and I don't know that it helps them think about it. So you don't want them intimidated. You don't want to make them feel used. I think sometimes People try to get converts like Girl Scouts selling cookies. It's another check off the list. So we don't want people to feel unloved, like a number, you know, anything like that. And the other part, too, is you don't want to be a bad example. You don't want to be that person who now, of course, we all sin, but being this very bad example. The funny story about me and becoming a Christian is that I belong to a bowling team for college. There were five women on this team. And all of a sudden, I show up to my first church service on a Sunday, and all four of them were there. They all go to the same church. And I said, you all come to the same church? Oh, yeah. That's how we got on this team, because we all knew each other, and we knew we were all bowlers, so we just needed the fifth person. And so I started traveling around with them on bowling tournaments. And one person in the church in particular, you know, I'm a brand new Christian. I mean, brand, brand new. And she almost did everything she could because she was away from home. She was away from anything. She drank and, you know, all the things. And I think she doesn't realize that it's not just about her, but it's also about the example she's making. And I think she had to be a little bit more conscious about the message she's sending to other people. The other thing that you realize, too, is that you don't have to be in a relationship with someone. Some people say, well, I'm trying to build up that relationship before I tell them about God. I have told people about God, talking to them in a store, in a line. Someone was crying behind me, and I said, hey, what's wrong? What's going on? And and she's like, oh, this happened and that happened, and I just can't get through my life anymore. And I said, well, I believe that Jesus is here for us, here to help us. I will pray for you, and, you know, here's my contact information. Send me an email if you want to talk about it. I believe God has good for you because he cares about you. And so it's a way that you can share who you are. So one of the easy ways that I do to talk about Christ and to to share the message is first, I let people know I'm a Christian. A long time, a person getting one of those fish things that they put on their car and they asked me if I wanted one too. And I said, well, you know, I don't think I ever drive, very Christian. And I would hate to be a bad example to people. And that's a terrible answer because the answer is I should drive like I'm a Christian. And 
same thing. You should live like you're a Christian. You know, someone gave that quote, maybe it was C.S. Lewis, that if there was a trial to condemn you of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to prove it? So you tell people that you're a Christian. I, I just say, well, Joe, what'd you do this weekend? Well, let's see. I went to church. It was Easter Sunday. Ooh, you're a Christian. They know immediately, right? Or I will say, I have a Christian podcast. So that you don't have to say, oh, by the way, I'm a Christian. There's a lot of ways of saying it without saying it. Certainly be a part of conversation. And then I have people invite me to talk about my faith. What are you doing this weekend that you have vacation next week? Oh, I speak at this Christian college every year and that's coming up. So I'm going to drive up to Minnesota and do that. Oh, well, why do you speak to a Christian college? Oh, oh. well, I became a Christian in college and I talk about my experience of what it's like not to be a Christian, what it looks like looking in at the faith when you're not one. And then the process, how I became a Christian. And then I talk a little bit about how to talk about Christ. Now they've asked me about it. I didn't force my opinion on them, but through just natural conversation, because my faith is important, because something was going on that involved my faith, I had an opportunity to talk about it. I think that's where people have the most difficult time. If faith is not a part of your life, if it's difficult for you to talk about, it's probably because you're having to reach to invent something to say. But It can be as simple as, oh, I spent the rainy weekend reading a really good book. It was the Screw Tape Letters. It's this conversation between these two demons trying to bring this man away from God. Really? Who's that by? Oh, it's by C.S. Lewis, you know, the guy who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. Oh, really? He wrote Christian books? Oh, yeah, even Narnia is a Christian book. Aslan is Jesus, you know. So you can have a conversation about things. Because your faith and being an active Christian is in your life. The other thing that you can do is you could do like my friend. And once things get a little bit over your head or someone brings up a really good question, you know, I would love for you to talk to my pastor about this. He is really good at answering these kinds of questions. Would it be okay if we scheduled like a lunch appointment and you could ask him that question? Because I'm sure he would have a really good answer. And I'm also very curious to hear what he says. Or even an event, like if your church is having a gathering, a Bible study, a service, invite them. Or maybe it's a book that you read that really has a big impact on you. I talk about that book, Heaven, which I did, my, I think, my second podcast on. And I tell people about that book because I know the very last chapter invites them in the most detailed way I've ever seen to become a believer in Christ. So it reinforces that conversation. Or even a podcast. There are many podcasts out there that invite people to become a member of God's church. And there are just different ways that, like that that you can bring in reinforcements to help you. Make sure that you tell them that you're praying for them, that you're thinking about them, that you wonder if they have ways that they would love for you to pray for them. And then make statements that are personal about your experience or what it meant to you, or if you had a hard time and this helped you through your hard time, or even, you know, in the pandemic. Again, I had that message where someone said, are you nervous about this? And I said, well, you know, I could be nervous about it, but I, la- I read the last page of the book and I know how all this ends. So I'm not that nervous. I'm more trying to help other people and make sure that they're okay. So your Christian witness has a lot to do, too, then number six, with your behaviors, that all your behaviors goes out to reinforce your message, kindness, of sharing, of helping people, and that community of God that's so important that makes an impact on everybody. When my roommate was telling me about Jesus, I think one of the reasons why it was so effective to me is her family had something. Obviously, I had a lot of problems growing up, and I was away from home for the first time, feeling like I had my act together. Finally, my life was my own. But when I saw my friend and I saw her family, I saw this inner peace. No matter what happened, whether it was financial, whether it was something 
turmoil, they had this solidness to them that made me want to have what they had. So I think that's a great step forward to help people understand exactly how having a faith like this impacts your daily life. So that is what I call my Jill's chicken technique to telling the gospel. I'm a chicken. I think a lot of people are a chicken, but it's a non-stressful way of talking about it. I also have one last thing about it is that a lot of times when people you talk to about God will say that if God was so loving, Why does he keep people out of heaven? And I say, well, God never keeps anybody out of heaven. We keep ourselves out of heaven. We reject the message, and that's what keeps it out. I said, imagine if I had a party. Every day I come to work and I say, Bob, come to my party. I don't want to come to your party. No, I'm telling you, Bob, here's an invitation. And every day and in every way, Bob gets this invitation to come to the party. And then, On Monday, Bob finds out that not only was the party fantastic, but it's forever and it's really heaven. Well, why didn't I come to the party? How come I wasn't there if this party was so amazing and so important to be at? I'm like, Bob, I sent you everything. I sent you invitations. I sent you emails. I told you to come. I begged you to come. And that's what God is really doing to all of us. He is begging us to come to heaven. And we are the ones saying, no, God excludes nobody from heaven and asks everyone to be a part of his family. And so I try to put it more in that way because God is wanting everybody in heaven. That was the idea. That is the idea. And so God never excludes anyone, but it is each of us who rejects the message of Jesus that's keeping our own lives from heaven. We're the ones doing it, not God. We'll talk a little bit later at another point about some evangelism styles that people in the New Testament had. But I hope this helps. I hope this kind of gives you some thoughts about how to be kind, be listening, be humble, and care for the people you talk to. I think it's a matter of being very human. There used to be this video I saw that was Out of the Salt Shaker by University Press. And there was a woman, I can't remember her name, and I'm sorry, but she was trying to evangelize to this family that was living in an apartment across the way from her apartment. And one day she had a really awful day and she came home and she was crying. And these people walked out of the door and said, oh, why are you crying? You know, come inside, come tell us about it. And so finally, at the end, they said, you know, we would now love to really hear about your message about Jesus you keep trying to tell us. And she goes, now? Now you want me to tell my message about Jesus? And they said, yeah, you were so happy and almost plasticky at times. We didn't think you were a real human being, but now we see you're a real human being. You have bad days. You have good days. You know, you're you're actually human. And we would love to hear what Jesus brings to your life. So that in the end, I think is the best message is that We are expected to be ourselves. God made us to be unique human beings with strengths and gifts. And we are meant to use those strengths and gifts. Maybe if I use bowling to bring people to God, there you go. I'm using my strengths and gifts. But think about your own strengths and gifts. So that's my challenge to you. Think about some ways that you have strengths and gifts. Are you good at art? Make Christian art. If you're good at music, make a song about it. If you're good into podcasting, try making a podcast about it. Or if you're a conversationalist, one-on-one, you're good at public speaking on large scales, whatever it is that you have a gift, try to bring the message of Christ in through your gifts. So I want you to think about one way that you relate to people very well and they hear you talk about something else, like a movie or a restaurant. Use that same technique and see if one time this week you couldn't tell them about your relationship to Jesus, the good news, and how God has everything planned for them and wants them to come home. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always email me 
at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I will pray for you. I'd love to hear your ideas. If you disagree with me, that's okay too. And just remember, our path to making the message of God reach out to everyone starts with small steps. <music>